Welcome to Storytime. My name is Jane Rabbit, and I will be reading two books to you today. The first one is The Bremontown Musicians, which was first published um, as a Grimm's fairy tale, and it's been uh, retold in this story from by Ruth Bailov Gross, and the pictures are by Jack Kent. There was once a donkey who was getting old. One day he heard his master say, that donkey is too old to work. Why should I feed him? If he won't feed me, thought the donkey, I will run away. Maybe I can work for him. I can't work for him anymore, but I'm good at music. I will go to Bremontown and be a musician there. And the donkey set out for Bremontown. On the way, he met a dog. What's wrong, said the donkey. You are out of breath. I'm getting too old to hunt, said the dog. I heard my master say he wanted to kill me, so I ran away. But what shall I do now? I know what, said the donkey. I'm going to Bremontown to make a little music. I can bray and you can bark. Come with me to Bremontown. We'll be musicians there. So off they went to Bremontown. Soon they met a cat. What's wrong, said the donkey. You look as sad as a rainy day. Why should I look happy, said the cat. I am getting too old to run after mice. I heard my mistress say she was going to drown me. So I ran away. But what shall I do now? You are good at, at night singing, said the donkey. Come with us to Bremontown. We'll be musicians there. So off they went to Bremontown. Soon they met a rooster. What's wrong with you, said the donkey. The way you crow, it makes me want to cry. I am crowing while I can, said the rooster. I heard my mistress say she was going to cut off my head and put me in the soup. You have a fine voice, said the donkey. Come with us to Bremontown. We'll be musicians there. So off they went, the donkey, the dog, the cat, and the rooster. All night they came, at night they came to a forest. It was dark, and they were ready to go to sleep. The rooster looked around. I see a light, he said. There must be a house nearby. A house, said the donkey. Let's go. Go. So off they went. Before long they came to the house. The donkey looked in the window. What do you see? said the rooster. What do I see? said the donkey. I see a table full of good things to eat and I see robbers at the table. They are eating and having a good time. I'd like some of that food, said the rooster. So would I, said the dog. But how can we get rid of the robbers? Let's all think, said the donkey. They, they all thought hard, and soon they were ready. All together now, said the donkey. One, two, three. Hee-haw, bow-wow, meow, cock doodle doo And they came crashing through the window. The robbers ran away, and the four friends ate and ate. Then they put out the lights and went to sleep. The robbers were hiding in the forest all this time. Why did we run away, they said. There's nothing to be afraid of. But they sent one robber back to make sure. Help, help, said the robber, and he ran to the door. The dog jumped up and bit the robber's leg. Help, help, said the robber, and he ran outside. The donkey woke up and gave the robber a good hard kick. What happened to the other robbers asked him. Oh, he said, 
A horrible witch spit at me. She scratched my face with her sharp nails, and then a monster near the door stabbed my leg with a knife. Then a giant hit me with a club, and a ghost screamed at me. The robbers never went back to the house again. But the donkey and the cat and the dog and the rooster liked the house so much that they stayed forever. They never went to Brementown to be musicians there. Okay, that is the end of my first book. Um, the second one is called Miss Rumpheus. And the story and pictures are by Barbara Cooney. By the way, these flowers are called lupins, and they are, they bloom in the spring. They're pretty much blooming now. I wanted to bring some, but uh, I couldn't find any that were blooming, so. The lupin lady lives in a small house overlooking the sea. In between the rocks around her house grow blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. The lupin lady is little and old, but she has not always been that way. I know. She is my great aunt, and she told me so. Once upon a time, she was a little girl named Alice who lived in a city by the sea. From the front stoop, she could see the wharves and the bristling masts of tall ships. Many years ago, her grandfather had come to America on a large sailing ship. Now he worked in the shop at the bottom of the house, making figureheads for the prows of ships, which means the front of the ships. And the figureheads were usually women, as you can see. Um, and he also made Indians out of wood to put in the front of cigar stores, which we really don't have anymore. For Alice's grandfather was an artist. He painted pictures, too, also of shipping, uh, sailing ships and places across the sea. When he was very busy, Alice helped him put in the skies on his paintings. In the evening, Alice sat on her grandfather's knee and listened to his stories of faraway places. When he finished, Alice would say, when I grow up, I too will go to faraway places, and when I grow old, I too will live beside the sea. That is all very well, little Alice, said her grandfather, but there is a third thing you must do. What is that? asked Alice. You must do something to make the world more beautiful, her grandfather said. All right, said Alice, but she did not know what that could be. In the meantime, Alice got up, washed her face, ate porridge for her breakfast. She went to school, came home, and did her homework, and pretty soon she was grown up. Then my great aunt Alice set out to do the three things she had told her grandfather she was going to do. She left home and went to live in a, another city far from the sea in the salt air. There she worked in a library dusting books and keeping them from getting mixed up and helping people find the ones they wanted. Some of the books told her about faraway places. People called her Miss Rumpheus now. Sometimes she went to the conservatory in the middle of the park. When she stepped inside on a wintry day, the warm, moist air wrapped itself around her and the sweet smell of jasmine filled her nose. This is almost like a tropical isle, said Miss Rumpheus, but not quite. So Miss Rumpheus went to a real tropical island where people kept cockatoos and monkeys as pets. She walked on long beaches, picking up beautiful shells. One day she met the Papa Raja, king of a fishing village. You must be tired, he said. Come into my house and rest. So Miss Rumpheus went in and met the Baba Raja's wife. 
the Baba Raja himself fetched a green coconut and cut a slice off the top so that Miss Rumphius could drink the coconut water inside. Before she left, the Baba Raja gave her a beautiful mother of pearl shell on which he had painted a bird of paradise and the words, you will always remain in my heart. You will always remain in mine too, said Miss Rumphius. My great aunt, Miss Alice Rumphius, climbed tall mountains where the snow never melted. She went through jungles and across deserts. She saw lions playing and kangaroos jumping. And everywhere she made friends she would never forget. Finally, she came to the land of the lotus eaters and there, getting off a camel, she hurt her back. What a foolish thing to do, said Miss Rumphius. Well, I have certainly seen faraway places Maybe it's time to find my place by the sea. And it was, and she did. From the porch of her new house, Miss Rumphius watched the sun come up. She watched it cross the heavens and sparkle on the water, and she saw it set in glory in the evening. She started a little garden among the rocks that surrounded her house, and she planted a few flower seeds in the stony ground. Miss Rumphius was almost perfectly happy, but there's still one more thing I have to do. I have to do something to make the world more beautiful. <coughs> Excuse me. But what? The world already is pretty nice, she thought, looking out over the ocean. The next spring, Miss Rumphius was not very well. Her back was bothering her again, and she had to stay in bed most of the time. The flowers she had planted the summer before had come up and bloomed in spite of the stony ground. She could see them from her bedroom window, blue and purple and rose-colored. Lupins, said Miss Rumphius with satisfaction. I have always loved lupins the best. I wish I could plant more seeds this summer so I could have still more flowers next year. But she was not able to. After a hard winter, spring came. Miss Rumphius was feeling much better. Now she could take walks again. One afternoon she started to go up over the hill where she had not been in a very long time. I don't believe my eyes, she cried when she got to the top. For there, on the other side of the hill, was a large patch of blue and purple and rose-colored lupins. It was the wind, she said as she knelt in delight. It was the wind that brought the seeds from my garden here, and the birds must have helped. Then Miss Rumphius had a wonderful idea. She hurried home and got out her seed catalogs. She sent off to the very best seed house for five bushels of lupin seeds. All that summer, Miss Rumphius, her pockets full of seeds, wandered over fields and headlands, sowing lupins. She scattered seeds along the highways and down the country lanes. She flung handfuls of them around the schoolhouses and in back of the church. She tossed them into hollows and along stone walls. Her back didn't hurt her anymore at all. Now, some people called her that crazy old lady. The next spring, there were lupins everywhere. Fields and hillsides were covered with blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. They bloomed along the highway and down the lanes. Bright patches lay around the schoolhouse and back of the church. Down in the hollows and along the stone walls grew the beautiful flowers. Miss Rumphius had done the third, the most difficult thing of all. My great aunt Alice, Miss Rumphius, is very old now. Her hair is very white. Every year there are more and more lupins. Now they call her the lupin lady. Sometimes my friend, 
it's my friend stand with me outside her gate, curious to see the old, old lady who planted the fields of lupins. When she invited us in, they come slowly. They think she is the oldest woman in the world. Often she tells stories of faraway places. When I grow up, I tell her, I too will go to faraway places and come home to live by the sea. That is all very well, little Alice, said my aunt. But there is a third thing you must do. What is that, I ask? You must do something to make the world more beautiful. All right, I said. But I do not know yet what can be. Okay, that's the end of um, Miss Rumpheus. And I just wanted to add that um, Miss Rumpheus is a made-up character modeled on a woman named Hilda Edwards Hamlin, who in 1904, which was a long time ago, more than 100 years, she immigrated to, the coast, to coastal Maine from England. Like Miss Rumpheus, Hamlin pursued a scholarly career and traveled widely. She eventually settled in her cabin in Christmas Cove on Maine's Damerscotter River. Uh, if you are thinking about growing lupins, by the way, remember they just love sandy and rocky soil. So that's um, the end of my story time. And um, thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Sharon Kimball. Welcome to Storytime. Today's story is The Very Impatient Caterpillar by Ross Burak. Hey, what are you guys doing? We're going to metamorphosize. Meta what now? Transform into butterflies. Right, right. I knew that. Wait, you're telling me I can become a butterfly? Yes. With wings? Yes. For real? Yes. Wait for me. Now what? Build your chrysalis. Chrysalis. Right, right. I knew that. What? How did you do that? Is it a spin or more of a twist? Am I a butterfly yet? Ugh. Now what? Just be patient and let nature take its course. Patience. Right. Right. I got this. Am I a butterfly yet? No. How about now? No. Now? No. Be patient. I have a question. Not yet. You don't even know what I was going to ask. Fine. Ask. How's your day going? Also, Am I a butterfly yet? No, just be patient. Shh, we're trying to metamorphosize. Okay, okay. Obviously I know this, but do you know how long this takes? Two weeks, right, right. Two weeks. Two weeks? Oh, what am I going to do in here for two weeks? Can I get a comic book or something? What if I need the bathroom? Anyone want to play a game? What if I want a snack? Hello, two pizzas please. My address? A chrysalis. Click. Hello? Hello? How long have I been in here? It's still day one. 
This is taking forever. That's it. I feel metamorphosized enough. Look out, world. Feast your eyes on this beautiful butterfly. How do I look? Transformed? Time to spread my wings and fly. Wait. Flap, flap, flap. Flap, flap. Where are my wings? Splat. Time for a new approach. Okay, you can do this. You can be patient. Okay, <laughs> who am I kidding? I can't be patient. Get a grip, you can. I can't, I can't. You are the little caterpillar that could. I am the little caterpillar that couldn't. You can. You, I can't. You can. I can't. You can. I can't. Can. Can't. Day one. I can be patient. Day two. Patience is all in the mind. Day three. Be one with the chrysalis. Day four, deep breath in. Day five, and out. Day six, look, day six. Day seven, I'm doing it. Day eight, just be patient. Day nine, just be patient. Day 10, day 11, two weeks later, I did it. I'm a butterfly. You know, I do feel transformed. Starting now, I'm going to be way more patient. That's great. Hey, where are you all going? We're migrating. Migrating. Right, right. Wait for me. Are we there yet? I don't know if that butterfly became any more patient, but I hope you enjoyed his metamorphosis. And I hope you enjoyed story time. Hi, I'm Sharon Kimball. Welcome to story time. This book is called All the Places to Love. It's by Patricia McLaughlin, and there are paintings on every page by Mike Wimmer. On the day I was born, my grandmother wrapped me in a blanket made from wool of her sheep. She held me up in the open window so that what I heard first was the wind. What I saw first were all the places to love. The valley, the river falling down over rocks, the hilltop where the blueberries grew. My grandfather was painting the barn, and when he saw me, he cried. He carved my name, Eli, on a rafter beside his name and grandmother's name, and the names of my papa and mama. Mama carried me on her shoulders before I could walk. Through the meadows and hayfields, the cows watched us and the sheep scattered. The dogs ran ahead, looking back with sly smiles. When the grass was high, only their tails showed. When I was older, Papa and I plowed the fields. Where else is soil so sweet, he said. Once Papa and I lay down in the field holding hands and the birds surrounded us, raucous black grackles, red wings, crows in the dirt 
that swaggered like pirates. When we left, Papa put a handful of dirt in his pocket. I did too. My grandmother loved the river best of all the places to love. That sound like a whisper, she said. Gathering in pools where trout flashed like jewels in the sunlight, grandmother sailed little bark boats downriver to me with messages. I love you, Eli, one said. We jumped from rock to rock to rock across the river to where the woods began where bunchberry grew under the pine needle path and trillium bloomed. Under the beech tree was a soft rounded bed where a deer had slept. The bed was warm when I touched it. When spring rains came and the meadow turned to marsh, cattails stood like guards and killdeers called, ducks nestled by marsh marigolds, and the old turtle, his shell all worn, no matter how slow, still surprised me. Sometimes we climbed to the place Mama loved best, with our blueberry buckets and a chair for my grandmother. To the blueberry barren, where no trees grew, the sky at arm's length away, where marsh hawks skimmed over the land, and bears came to eat fruit, and wild turkeys left footprints for us to find, like messages. Where else, said my mama, can I see the sun rise on one side and the sun set on the other? My grandfather's barn is sweet smelling and dark and cool. Leather harnesses hang like paintings against old wood. And hay dust floats like gold in the air. Grandfather once lived in the city and once he lived by the sea. But the barn is the place he loves most. Where else, he says, can the soft sound of cows chewing make all the difference in the world. Today we wait, him sitting on a wooden slat chair and me on the hay, until much later my grandmother holds up a small bundle in the open window. Wrapped in a blanket made from the wool of her sheep, and my grandfather cries. Together, we carve the name Sylvie in the rafter beside the names of grandfather and grandmother and my mama and papa and me. My sister is born. Someday I might live in the city. Someday I might live by the sea. But soon, I will carry Sylvie on my shoulders through the fields. I will send her messages downriver in small boats, and I will watch her at the top of the hill, trying to touch the sky. I will show her my favorite place, the marsh, where ducklings follow their mother like tiny tumbles of leaves. All the places to love are here, I'll tell her. No matter where you may live, where else, I will say, does an old turtle crossing the path make all the difference in the world? Thank you for joining us for Storytime. Mm -hmm.